Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we are here to talk to you about the issues surrounding mandated uh, back doors. Uh, and we have a uh, distinguished uh, panel here. Uh, so we'll start with some introductions and then uh, get into the discussion. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. EFF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online. Uh, we've been involved in the crypto wars uh, since the 1990s. Crypto wars, now we understand, is part one. We thought it was the war to end all wars, but that turns out not to work in the long term. Uh, and so now we're into uh, Crypto Wars 2, where uh, the Empire is striking back and trying to make sure that uh, you all have access to secure end-to-end -end encryption. So my name is Amy Stepanovich. I'm U.S. Policy Manager at Access Now, which I'm going to let my colleague Nathan um, describe what Access Now does because he does it much better than I do. Um, so instead, I will just say I've been working on the issue of crypto for basically my entire professional career and also provide a warning to those of you in the audience that when we, the five of us, say crypto, we mean encryption or cryptography or some variant of that and not cryptocurrencies. And if you are in this room because you thought we were going to be talking about Bitcoin, you're going to be very disappointed. Stay and learn something. But stay and learn something anyway. Hi, I'm Matt Blaze. I'm a computer science professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have been working on cryptography and related things for all of my professional career, um, including um, Crypto War One and where we are now, which is we are now understand to call it Crypto War Two, um, and uh, I'll be providing kind of some of the technical perspective on this. Uh, my name is Nathan White. I do work with Amy at Access Now. Uh, Access Now is an international nonprofit that works for users at risk around the world. We defend digital rights online. We provide direct technical support for specific users at risk who may have unique threats. For example, human rights defenders, journalists in high risk locations, uh, people who are fighting for their human rights. We also have policy and advocacy offices in places where policy is decided, like Washington, D.C., United Nations, Brussels. I think we have something like 15 locations around the world where, where we have office or staff. Uh, I'm not sure that I can confidently say I work on encryption. I just really like the internet technology and privacy and things that require me to continually talk about encryption. But I'm not sure that I can say I'm an expert on encryption like everyone else up here. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin Bankston. I'm a law-talking guy. Uh, I've spent uh, my entire legal career working in the public interest on digital rights issues from organizations like the ACLU, the Center for Democracy and Technology, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I now run an organization in Washington, D.C. called the Open Technology Institute uh, that works on promoting policies to ensure that everybody has access to an Internet that is both open and secure, uh, and encryption is a big part of that. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. So uh, I'll start out just with a, just a, the briefest of, of overviews of sort of what it is that we're what we're really talking about. Uh, so what we mean by uh, uh, crypto backdoors are uh, manners to, in which um, secure end to end communications will be weakened. Uh, so there there uh, encryption is uh, we can have a, a greater uh, discussion from some of our panelists but basically a way to take something which is human readable plain text and make it to be very difficult to read as a crypto text and then when it gets to the person you want to read it they can turn it back into plain text and, and, and do that and the idea is that you want it to be only available to those you should have it and not to, uh, not to any others uh, and this runs up against uh, the, the government uh, sometimes has an interest in wanting to see what people are saying to each other and they would like to have access uh, to that plain text. Um, so in Crypto Wars uh, Part 1, we can go further into detail on this, but very, very briefly, it was about uh, trying to limit strength of encryption, making it so that you could not uh, export, uh, uh, export or uh, uh, publish on the Internet strong encryption that was 
difficult for the government to undermine. You could only make available uh, outside the United States, at least, uh, encryption that was weak and easy to uh, easy to break. And this was done. Uh, a lot of the initial work was done in the context of export controls, um, where uh, for a while there was a web browser from uh, Netscape, the uh, uh, predecessor to Firefox. Uh, where they had a domestic version that was uh, relatively strong for its time and an international version which was laughably weak uh, in order to affect this. And so one of the things that my organization did uh, during that time period was uh, uh, challenge these, uh, these rulings uh, and get a, a court to say that code was speech and publishing strong encryption on the internet was protected by the First Amendment uh, and allowing that to to go forward, um, we could we could probably go over the history of these crypto wars in, in in great detail and take up the whole hour, but I uh, I don't want to do that. Um, but instead, um, given that the government says they need to have access to this stuff for for various reasons, uh, and they want to just all they want is for totally secure encryption, but also for government to have access to the plain text upon reading, and. Uh, Matt, could you explain why why that might be a bad idea? Why might that be challenging to accomplish? Sure. Um, so, I'm uh, I'm a computer scientist, uh, which is a little embarrassing because the branch of computer science I'm in is computer security, and that's the one branch of computer science that just seems to screw everything up and get worse and worse from year to year. Uh, the the you know dirty secret, and it's not much of a secret, is we just don't collectively know what we're doing. Um, and uh, you know, you, you can laugh and that sounds funny, but the, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's funny because it's true. Um, one of the fundamentally difficult problems in computer science is that we just don't know how to systematically build reliable software-based systems of any kind of complexity. And you know, it's, it's so difficult to do that that you know, the reason isn't because the people choosing to do this are, you know, stupider than other kinds of engineers or less, you know, competent or less dedicated. It's because this is real, I mean, that may be true, but it's not the fundamental reason, right? The fundamental reason is that this is just exceptionally difficult. The number of moving pieces that interact with each other in large software systems is so huge and brings so much complexity uh, to it that uh, we just don't know how to reason about things that are uh, of this complexity. Um, you know, and this has been actually one of the very first problems in computing. The term bug dates back to pretty much the invention of the programmable uh, computer and it's been arguably getting worse every time. Particularly from a security point of view, this is really a problem. Um, you probably noticed that devices want to be patched regularly, if you're lucky, uh, to uh, fix the latest security vulnerabilities that have been discovered in them and so on. All right, so what do we do about the fact that things are insecure? Well, it's actually worse than that. Not only are the devices we use that are based on software insecure, we're also using them for increasingly important things and we're uh, exposing them to increasingly greater threats. Uh, we're uh, doing a lot of our computing on mobile devices uh, that we you know, leave in taxis uh, all the time and get stolen from us and that leave our uh, possession uh, all the time, uh, at least mine does uh, and apparently Amy's does too. Um, so we, you know, we basically are depending on increasingly bad security against increasing risk um, with increasing stakes. So what do we do about that? Well, computer security people will basically tell you, well, we have a, we have a couple answers and one of them you're not gonna like very much, which is make things less complex. Um, so you know, we do know how to reason about a little bit very, very simple software systems. We just don't use very simple software systems. We add features, we don't sub ever subtract them. Uh, computers are getting bigger and more complicated and that's just always gonna be with us. The second thing that we have are some tools, 
particularly encryption, that allow us to depend on fewer components of the system to be secure. So essentially what cryptography does is lets you, lets you say, look, I know this data is going to be exposed in all sorts of insecure ways. I'm going to design the system that when it's in certain components that I know are going to be insecure, I can tolerate that insecurity because anyone who gets access to the data won't be able to make use of it because it's encrypted. So encryption is one of the very, very few tools that we have that's practical to use for making our increasingly insecure network and computing infrastructure a little more tolerably secure. So the government um, is among the only organizations, particularly the FBI and the law enforcement parts of the government, are pretty much among the only organizations that have the complaint that computers are too secure. Um, and you know, pretty much everyone else would agree that they're not secure enough. In fact, even most of the government would agree that they're not secure enough. But um, law enforcement has actually been making the case over the last 20 years that, uh, that all of these things are way too secure. And in particular, when they want to do certain types of investigations involving either wiretaps or increasingly uh, seized mobile devices, phones that might have data on them, um, they worry that the encryption works and is actually doing its job properly. And they have been asking uh, for uh, the industry uh, to design systems that don't actually use effective encryption that works. Now, as somebody who's fighting this losing battle, I really, really worry about not only making encryption worse, but also making one of the very few tools that we have that, uh, that works effectively itself more complicated and more unreliable in order to comply with this weird mandate that sometimes the encryption has to work, but other times it has to be breakable. I just don't know how to do that and neither do any of my really smart friends. So. All right, and so what about, like, can we just have a secure golden key that would, uh, uh, can you have that with you? So this is a, this is a callback to a, a Washington Post uh, a editorial where they said uh, the wizards of, of technology should just make a secure golden key, which was like a really nice magical metaphor because it was also would require some, some magic to, to accomplish. I mean, Matt, if we can put a man on the moon... Why can't we put a man on the sun? Why? <laughs> hey, you know, that's my line. That's your line. I'm sorry. Uh, I stole his line. That totally is his line. Guys, yeah. we have all five of us been talking about this issue for a really long time. Yeah. And if you ask any one of us, we could probably switch the name tags around and all do this panel as one of the other panelists. I, I've actually never met any of these people before. <laughs> it's, uh, all right, so Kevin, uh, so what's going on in D.C.? Oh, goodness. Uh, um, are, are there any crypto backdoor bills that we need to worry about? Not right where, where now, no. The last one of those was a couple of years ago from Senators Feinstein and Burr, and um, it was widely ridiculed. Um, I mean, speaking generally, I think that uh, absent some sort of new uh, attack that becomes a political football on this issue, um, we're actually doing pretty well if you're one of the people who is opposed to, to mandatory uh, insecurity in our encryption uh, in the U.S. Um, you know, in really, uh, the nail was in the issue, you know, in the coffin of the issue at the end of 2016 when uh, the two key House committees uh, that would look at this issue if something came up, the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee, came out with a big bipartisan report basically saying, this is a bad idea. We're not going to do it. We should focus on arming our police to take advantage of the data that is available without backdoors rather than trying to make things more insecure. This was coming off of several votes on some amendments to some must-pass bills that were very favorable on the issue. Um, and since then, the issue's really only gotten harder for the DOJ uh, for five reasons, several of them like self-inflicted wounds by the DOJ, um, and in, just in the, uh, the past year or so. The first was simply Trump firing Jim Comey. Uh, Jim Comey was the primary voice on this issue. Uh, his firing put the FBI into disarray on a lot of things, including this issue, which meant that there was really no um, offensive game coming from the FBI on this issue for quite a while. 
Um, in the meantime, several things happened uh, on the defensive side. First, the National Academy of Sciences, after, coming, after bringing together a bunch of different experts on this issue from different sides of the issue, uh, came out with a report. And although it was not uh, as helpful as the report that the NSA, NAS put out in the 90s, which basically said, this is a stupid idea, don't do it, in part because they'd been told, you don't get to answer that question, just tell us what questions we should be asking, basically came up with a list of seven big questions that anyone should be able to answer if they put forward a backdoor mandate. Um, like, how are you going to do it without hurting security? How are you going to do it without hurting our international competitiveness? How are you going to sell a more insecure product internationally? Um, how is this actually going to make us safer? Because we are talking about an international software market where people can easily get software that does have encryption even if you outlaw it here. How are you going to stop other countries that are less respectful of human rights from violating human rights by taking advantage of these tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Basically creating a sort of like question firewall for the next bill. So when someone introduces something, you'd say, well, Senator Feinstein, what are your answers to these seven really hard questions? Um, then there was another report from the Inspector General of the DOJ all about the Cupertino, San, uh, San Bern, sorry, San Bernardino shooting case, which was a big court case where uh, the government tried to force Apple to create a specialized version of its OS, uh, its iPhone OS. Can we close that door, please? Okay. Um, uh, in order to unlock a locked phone, and in making its representations to the court in that case, the government basically had to say, we've exhausted all the other possibilities. Our only option is to force Apple to code this solution for us. And the IG report basically, although it's sort of politically cabbed in its language, basically showed that the DOJ, because they wanted this test case, had not actually really investigated other ways they might unlock that phone. And when they did finally do that, they almost immediately found a vendor of hacking tools who could unlock the phone for them. Um, Celebrite, I believe. Um, which leads us to the next point. This is number four of the five things. Um, there's been a lot of reporting recently that a company uh, uh, called GrayShift has a tool called GrayKey that has basically been allowing law enforcement to unlock pretty much any model of iPhone for a $30,000 investment in a box. Um, and then you can unlock all the phones you want. Um, this is a great object lesson in the, in the fact that, that Matt has been saying, which is, these engineers are in a constant state of uh, you know, arms race with people trying to unlock their phones, trying to break their security, often to make a profit like this company who finds a way of exploiting the phones and then sells their ability to do that to states, uh, including our own. Um, and so this highlighted, why are you trying to make them make their security worse when it's already so bad that you can have third parties like this building and selling hacking capabilities into these tools. Um, lately, iPhone did take steps to, to try and cut off this tool by strengthening the security on its, uh, its lightning ports, um, but there will be another cracking tool. There will always be another cracking tool. And then fifth and finally, and this is the saddest, funniest bit, um, the FBI has consistently been saying we have X thousands of locked phones in criminal cases that we cannot unlock. And they were continually citing this number of around seven to 8,000 iPhones that, that they could not break because of this uh, warrant proof encryption. And a few months ago, they had to come back and admit, um, we got the math on that wrong and it's closer to about 1,200 Whoopsie. phones. And so, they didn't do a whole lot in terms of helping their credibility uh, in this fight uh, when that happened. Now, to be clear, and I think everyone on this panel would admit it, there will be phones that are important in criminal cases that won't get unlocked because of this security. There will be like opportunities lost in investigations because of this technology. The question is, what is the cost-benefit analysis on that? Are we preventing enough crimes with the encryption to outweigh the cost to investigations that we're going to have from the encryption, noting that that cost can be, to some extent, ameliorated by the use of other cracking tools, the use of all the other data that we're generating in our modern digital lives that cops didn't have access to even 10 years ago, 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so right now, we're actually doing pretty good on this debate in the US. And it's in the international scene where the greatest worry is and where I think the DOJ is hoping the most movement will happen. And then they can just come in after other countries have screwed things up for us. All right, well, that is that's a very good point, because even if uh, uh, the United States doesn't have legislation, of course, many of these companies operate around the world, uh, have to sell their products in various jurisdictions. Um, Amy, wh what is going on with encryption around the world? I'm really too short for the mic to be this far at the table. It's uh, There we go. Sorry, Scott. Thank you. Um, so I, would, I just actually want to start with a little bit of a thought exercise, which will tell you um, why it's a big deal that the United States is not the only country having this specific exact debate about whether or not to pass a law that requires companies to do something about encryption. And to do that, I'm going to deputize Kurt as his own country, country of Kurt. Kurdistan. I am going to deputize Matt as his own country. These two just happen to be on either side of me. Matt, what country are you? Mattistan. You are not creative people at all. Oh. <laughs> um, I am going to be the United States of Amy. Um, and let's think through this a little bit. So. All right, Nathan, you can have a country. <laughs> um, so imagine that I do not have a law currently about encryption, but Kurt Istan says that you have to implement only encryption of a certain strength, and Madistan requires that you have to register all of your encryption keys with the government. Um, it means that if Nathan, as his own private company trying to sell N phones to all of you, um, is to choose who to sell his end phones to, he's probably going to base his company in the United States of Amy and not choose to base it in any place where either Madistan or Kurdistan can try to exercise direct jurisdiction over that company. And so if these two are trying to compete or increase their technological economy, their digital economy, they're losing an opportunity to attract new tech talent into their markets to a third party um, where that person can operate and offer more secure services. The other thing that it does is if a private company decides they want to access all of these markets and do business in all three places, um, so imagine uh, Nathan is a really rich company, the end phones are doing really well, he's making a lot of money. Um, Kevin operates a brand new startup company, um, not doing so well, just doesn't have the customer base yet, doesn't have a lot of resources. Nathan might be able um, to operate three different end phones. One that only, per only offers very weak encryption, um, that he will only sell in Kurdistan. One that might operate um, with individual encryption keys, so he can turn them all over to Madistan. And one that's really strong, that he'll sell in the United States to Amy and the rest of the world. Um, that means that each country citizens will get the exact amount of security that their government offers them, which is not so bad, but it's not great. Um, but new startup companies that might challenge Nathan's market dominancy and offer better services, more security, um, more options, which is always good in the market, the, he, Kevin is going to have a different option. He could either only sell in the United States of Amy, meaning and offer the most secure product he can or since he can't afford to create three separate products he has to create one product that satisfies all three standards and sell them to everybody which means kevin has a just naturally less secure product than nathan probably won't do as well in the market and is is not able to offer the choice and the options that might otherwise be available to all of you if both of them were able to operate, um, to offer an equally secure product. So we look at these international standards and we ask ourselves one thing, how are they different from one another? How do they create new complications? And what do they mean for companies and for the economy? Why are you both laughing at me? Just no. it occurred to me that we're, we all have iPhones. Yeah, we do all have iPhones phones, up here. Please. And phones. Um, <laughs> So we, we were paying attention to the international stage and the um, 
the environment out there isn't really positive. For example, China already has a law in place that says that if companies are, do business in China, um, they have to turn over evidence to the government if the government requests that evidence. And if a company decides that they are going to not turn that evidence over, or they can't, they, they honestly don't have it because it's encrypted, and the government decides that's a serious violation of their law, um, there is no upper limit to the fine that China can issue against that company. Um, so China could essentially issue a fine that is for all of Apple's revenue for a given year um, or more um, if they decide that that is a serious violation of their law. Uh, Colombia outright bans encryption for normal use. It requires it for um, government officials, but normal people cannot use any encryption in Colombia. Luckily, they've never um, actually enforced that. Um, there are laws being pursued. India had a draft policy. We're expecting to see a second draft policy this year. Their first draft policy got revoked, I think it was 48 hours later, because it was so laughably ridiculous. Um, they specifically said you can use encryption, you can use as strong of encryption as you want. We don't care how strong you want to encrypt your databases. You just have to have a second database that stores all of the same information in plain text. <laughs> and that is the appropriate reaction to that. So they withdrew that policy. Um, we're expecting something else to come soon. Um, there are also um, statements being made by the Five Eyes countries. For those of you who don't work on um, intelligence and national security issues all the time, the Five Eyes is essentially um, the strongest, most powerful national security and intelligence partnership in the entire world. It can I, I, I love that this is a real thing. That's actually what they're called. Oh, yeah, that yeah. is actually yeah. the thing. That is their name. I'm not making this up. It's not from James Bond. It's um, be just like the Five Eyes of Sauron or something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it, it consists of Australia, I'm doing these alphabetically, guys, I'm not preferencing any country. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States are the five eyes. One, two, three, four, five. Um, they, ha they have an annual, a biannual meeting. They meet every two years. Different um, representatives from the countries. Two years ago, they met in Canada, and they were like, we got to do something about this encryption problem, dudes. All dudes. Uh, no, Amber Rudd from the UK, not a dude. Um, we got to do something about this encryption problem. Um, let's like let's get together and decide to do something about it. And so we sent a letter and we asked, what are you going to do about it? Some of them wrote back. They didn't say much of anything, so we didn't get a lot more information about what they were going to do. The UK did call me Arnie um, when they responded. They've since um, individuals within the UK government have apologized to me um, for miss. Placing my name, the kerning creates some issues with the M. It's an R and then an N. Um, we didn't really know. Their most recent meeting, they actually met last month in Australia. Australia, of course, um, and this is where I turn this over to Nathan, um, has been waging a war similar to the United States on encryption for several years now. Um, the laws of mathematics supposedly don't work in Australia. I'll let Nathan talk about that more. Um, and I'll let him fill you in on what happened in the Five Eyes meeting last month. Nathan? Uh, would you like to talk about the United Kingdom first? No? Not right now. Okay. Uh, we, we talk about this a lot. Um, so my job is a little bit different than the, the others. I work closely with Amy in, in DC, and where she does things that are very, very smart, my job is more to do actual things to stop people from doing dumb things. So I'm a bit more of an activist. And my work with Access Now has been to try to convince governments generally, specifically governments, but also government agencies, generally not to do dumb things, at least in the field of encryption. So over the last couple of years, uh, it, Amy and I started an international group. We hosted securetheinternet.org, which has, I think, 230 members from 68 countries now, which have all signed on to a joint declaration that is basically, encryption's good, don't mess with encryption. And the reason we built this was because there are these threats that pop up everywhere around the world of India, maybe just for a day or two, maybe somewhere else. And we found organizations in these countries 
you know, we're trying to push back and say, look, the international community already has said this is a bad idea, but we have to rebuild these coalitions in every single government. So, or in every single country. So we started this coalition so that we were just pre-ready to go. When a country says, hey, we've got a bad idea to do something stupid, we can say, well, we got 200 friends that say that's a bad idea and you should not do that. Uh, so we've gotten fairly decent at responding pretty quickly to bad things. We've also gotten pretty decent at talking to law enforcement around the world of what their problems are. Um, I think Actually, everybody has been at all three of these. We've held three crypto summits uh, in the last couple of years. Crypto Summit 1, Crypto Summit 2, we were very clever. And then we mixed it up and called it a crypto colloquium. And in these conversations, we've gotten technologists and government people and law enforcement, uh, to the extent that they're willing to participate, to come together and say, look, encryption is here. Let's talk about things that maybe we could do to make your life easier that from my perspective, I'm carrying around a phone that leaves a data trail about everything I do and everything that I talk to, and most of it's not encrypted. Everything that's backed up in the cloud is not encrypted. That seems like it gives you a lot for law enforcement to look into. And law enforcement says, no, we just want to see what your WhatsApp, we want to know what your last, last texts were, we want to know what your emails are. Um, and through those conversations, we have figured out there are a lot of things that people around the world have problems with. Um, one is maybe the data does exist and law enforcement on a state and local level doesn't know it exists, doesn't know how to get it, or increasingly in an international sense, it's stored in the United States or a foreign country and you d can't get the information or you can't get it timely because you have to go through a mutual legal assistance treaty program, which takes generally about a minimum of six months to get any data back whatsoever. If you want to hear all about that, come to our panel tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. on the Cloud Act. See what I did there? Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about that again. Thank you. Um, so that uh, is, is a lot of way to say that is why we have been getting heavily involved in Australia. Because while the United States, things are going pretty well in the, in the encryption fight, things are going, I want to make an upside down joke, uh, the exact opposite in Australia. Things are actually pretty bad uh, down there, in part because the government has this idea that the United States and the United Kingdom have somehow cracked this crypto problem and that companies are doing something in the United Kingdom, in the United States, that somehow Australia doesn't have access to. So about a year ago, Prime Minister Turnbull, uh, then Prime, Prime Minister Prime Turnbull, Minister Turnbull. <laughs> they, they go through prime ministers pretty quickly down there, uh, gave, a, gave a big speech and said, we are going to solve the encryption problem in Australia, and it's great that all these companies believe in encryption, uh, but we're just not going to, we're not going to hear that. We're going to solve the encryption problem, and we're going to introduce legislation that's going to fix the problem. And somebody asked the question, well, what about the law of math that says if you build in a weakness, anybody can exploit it? And Prime Minister Turnbull said, well, that's great. The law of math is really good, but in Australia, the law of Australia will rule. And everyone kind of snickered <laughs> and walked away and said, okay, Mr. Prime Minister, you have fun with that. Um, parenthetical, he is a former telecom minister who made his money in tech company investments and as the telecom minister told everyone to use encryption and yeah. VPNs his entire time. So he should know better. Uh, he continued these kind of bellicose talking points for about a year uh, and then Last month, the government finally revealed the legislation that they've been working on for the last year. And I say revealed because they didn't actually introduce it into the parliament. They published it online and said, we would like feedback. The feedback's due September 10th, and Amy has four days next week to finish our comments. Um, the bill is crazy pants. The bill would give the government Basically, there's three sections to it, but the first section is the only one that, that we're really going to talk about tonight. It gives the government the authority to do three things. It says a government agency can go to a tech company and ask for information and ask for help if they face something like encryption or anything at all. Two, a, a government agency can go to a company or organization and require them to do any act or thing or provide any information. Pretty much period. Any act or thing or provide any information. This third section says the attorney general and only the attorney general may go to a company and order a warrant saying you must build the technical capability into your system to comply with a future request to do act or things or provide information. 
But then they put another document out and said, but don't worry, we're not going to backdoor encryption. So we've been studying this for the last month, and really it seems like it's one of those games where they're hiding the ball and moving the cups around. They have said, we are not going to do specifically what you've told us. We are not going to break end-to-end -end encryption that will have a, uh, an effect on a systematic number of users. And then in parentheses, they define systematic as something that will affect all users. But they still expect you to be able to unlock a particular device if they require you to. They could also require you to put any kind of surveillance device into your network. You'd have to provide information about what your network is. You'd have to provide physical access to your network. Um, you would have to basically be able to do anything that the government might one day ask that you that they would want to. It also said may. There's no court requirement. There's no probable cause standard. It just says if we think it's reasonable and appropriate, we can do this. So obviously that's really, really bad. And then they, they've put this out and groups are, like ours are pushing back and suggesting that maybe you want to think this through. This isn't such a great idea. Uh, and then it, it's actually last week they met in Sydney with the Five Eyes ministerial uh, governments and put out a statement which was essentially a threat to the world's tech companies of figure this out or we're going to legislate it. It was drafted by the Australian delegation and it's very clearly the same people who have written this bill. Um, I would like to leave you with uh, a bit of optimism, so I will say the bill has not been introduced officially yet, and I think it is so crazy that they will receive a lot of pushback. I think they know that they're they're not going to get everything that they want here, um, but it is a serious threat. Australia does not have a First Amendment or a Bill of Rights or a right to privacy or even the concept of privacy that we understand in the United States. Uh, Australia for being a Western government is very pro-surveillance and generally okay with tell letting the government do whatever they want. Uh, so this is a very serious threat that where comments are due on September 10th, if you have anybody in Australia, tell them to call their member of parliament. Just to underscore that real quick, um, if you were to name the, con the country that has single-handedly implemented more surveillance law since 9-11 than any other country in the world, the answer would be Australia, not the United States, um, which I find to be incredibly interesting that that is where 9-11 has had a more detrimental impact on surveillance um, even than at home. And then one thing I just want to add, add on to that is like, um, there's an important difference of how the, the government's approach was from Crypto Wars Part 1 and Part 2. Uh, in part one, there were some attempts to be sort of specific about what you could do. You couldn't have export encryption that was greater than this difficulty to, to crack. Or they made uh, the a chip, the Clipper chip, which was a, a chip with a key escrow design that turns out that uh, Matt Blaze uh, was able to find some serious flaws in. Um, but then they realized from their mistake of actually putting out a solution for then the technologist to be able to look at that solution, find the flaws and show why it wouldn't work. So now they say, we want to have secure encrypted devices that also give us access. It is your problem, technologist, to find a way to have the cake and eat it too. So the statement that uh, uh, I was just talking about from the five eyes, Government should not favor a particular technology. This is part of it's not our problem to, to figure out this technical solution. Instead, privers may create customized solutions tailored to their individual systems. They're capable of meeting lawful access requirements. Like, that's all we want. We just want to have lawful access. How you do it is up to you. You just have to have it. So it uh, gives us plain text access and uh, is also secure. So solve it. And okay. Can I talk about the yeah, FBI for a second? Uh, so th this is a fun story that we don't uh, get to publicize very much. Um, back under the Obama administration, there were a lot of people who said, we need to solve this issue. We're going to call on you, I promise. <laughs> uh, we're going to solve this problem, and we need to do it. Uh, the FBI and the, the Commerce Department, NTIA, and several organizations came together and said, we're going to have an interagency process where we're going to have a government position on encryption. A few of our organizations found out that the government was getting fairly close to issuing a statement, and so EFF and Access Now started SaveCrypto.org to get 100,000 signatures in 30 days through the We the People petition site, 
and we were told by our friends on the inside that the Obama administration had the draft of a statement that they were prepared to release that would essentially say, encryption is gonna be a problem for law enforcement for the foreseeable future, but we're not gonna break it because doing so would be even worse. And they got all elements of the government to sign on with the exception of the FBI, who understood the statement and said they would not reject it, but they would not sign any document that would ever acknowledge there would be cases that the FBI could not solve or data the FBI could not get. So because the FBI and Mr. Comey in particular's refusal to sign that document, the Obama administration left without ever resolving the encryption question. Rumor is that the Trump administration has renewed that interagency process, although anybody who works for government in any of those agencies, I ask them every time I see them, and not one of them have told me they've ever had a meeting or a memo on it. So I assume it's just a talking point that, that they're doing that at this case. But do would like to end with a, a thanks Obama there, that we almost had a really good resolution to this a couple of years and just couldn't quite get it done. All right, well, let's I have a question here in the, in the front row. Uh, I know you're kind of like, I know you're kind of like hand waving about the like, if you know anybody in the Australian you know, thing, um, but <laughs> if uh, for somebody that knows multiple people in the New Zealand government, um, <laughs> they're much better. Uh, they, in many ways, um, is is there something I should be talking to them about or or, or anything like that that uh, maybe I should be impressing upon them uh, that's important that needs to be pushed through? So I would say that there's not a live threat in New Zealand. All of the Five Eyes countries are working together on this, and they're all kind of looking at Australia. The United Kingdom also has some some open threads, but are, are not moving as much at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the people that we work with in New Zealand are also kind of focusing on Australia of, if they break it in Australia, that's the place where it's gonna break for everybody. Um, but I would say still participate. New Zealand and Australia, they, they're in the same time zone and speak the same language, so they still they're work the collaboratively. Yeah. Um, we have a, a website called secureaustralia.org.au that we built and then recruited a bunch of digital rights groups in Australia that is uh, more of an activist place of you can sign up and say, don't screw with uh, uh, encryption, and we send that to members of parliament, that that would be a resource that you could point people to. Um, from a government level, if you can get anybody to make a statement that says this is a bad idea, that'd be fantastic. There's the open uh, comment portal. Yeah, like uh, Keys isn't in power anymore, so whatever. Mm -hmm. But I know people in, in the trade department and in the statistics department. Yeah, so the government's not unilateral on this stuff. The, generally, the, the FBI wants all the data. They want everything. State and local just want help because they get a phone. They don't know what, it, what information's available. They don't know how to call it Apple. They don't know what is still possible. And if you're in another country and you go through MLATS, it gets even harder. So FBI wants all the data. State and local wants help. Lots of the other branches of the government are not the enemy on this. Commerce Department in particular is saying, hey, we want people to sell these phones overseas. We don't want to say, hey, we've got the pre-surveillance equipment. We want to sell these big chips and we're competing with China. Uh, so commerce is one of our biggest allies. Uh, as uh, Kevin mentioned, the Judiciary and Commerce Committees are some of our biggest allies. And you wouldn't think about it, but the spooks are some of our biggest allies. The CIA, they don't like to do dead drops anymore. A lot of their programs, you might have heard, they actually screwed up the encryption, and a whole bunch of our Chinese operatives were murdered in the last couple of years. They don't do the dead drops anymore. They're using encrypted services too. NSA, they, they probably broke some of the encryption that we think is not yet broken, but they also are willing to say, this isn't a problem for us. We can do the surveillance we need. Don't, don't worry about us, we're cool. So trade, if you know people at trade, they're always great to work with. Just a fun fact on the like national security being on the right side of this, especially the people who've come out of government who can speak more freely about this uh, have been very supportive. You have people like Mike McConnell, who was formerly NSA director and the director of national intelligence, uh, Michael Hayden, uh, who ran NSA and CIA, uh, Michael Chertoff, uh, who was DHS secretary, uh, Mike Morrill, who was uh, CIA director. And those are, those are just the Michaels. 
um, <laughs> you know, and and so there. Often on these surveillance issues, um, you have basically all of law enforcement and national intelligence aligned against us. On this one, we've never had more national security validators on our side than on this issue. All right, do we have some uh, additional questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so if, if Australia were to pass this crazy pants digital security law, is the would it be possible for all the major tech companies to say you know what then to hell with you we're just not going to do we're just not going to do allow any of our tech stuff in australia and let you sort of go back to 1986 and then see how you like it and then when you want to like come into the real world and stop playing silly buggers like we can talk later like is that actually a is that actually a possible move that tech, com uh, tech companies could make to sort of uh, disallow the ability to pass terrible uh, well, yeah. security bills? That might happen, but you know, companies aren't great at passing up money. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, let, let me give you two possible scenarios, and. I, you know, I think one is more, one is unfortunately much more likely than the other that I think are within the realm of realistic. One possibility is that Australia gets its own technology, right? That you know, every company that wants to do business in Australia implements a separate Australia version, and it really sucks, right? Phones end up costing you know twice as much as they cost before. Phone theft goes up. Um, you know, and terrible things happen with this Australia-only version of the phone. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that companies say, we don't want to have to have a separate Australia version. We're going to have, we're going to make our phone Australia-friendly. And everyone gets it. Um, and, you know, it'll just be that much worse for everybody. So that's possible. And I, I think another hypothetical to consider is imagine every tech company that you can name decides they're going to make Australia friendly products. Is a smart criminal going to buy any of those? No. They're going to go to Japan and buy a Japanese product or they're going to go to Russia and buy a Russian product and they're going to go buy a product that they know won't have those inherent weaknesses because they're criminals and that's what they want to do. Oh, okay. Uh, following on that, um, you, you talk about companies that are trying to push and be as competitive as possible with uh, with cryptography. Are there any people who are trying to sell governments on uh, on a on a backdoor solution? I mean, have you seen any technologists come out and say, "Oh, here's our our golden key version, and it sucks, but you know, you don't know better." Yeah, I mean, there, there have been. I mean, the, the, the Aussie one. The... There have been a couple people who have proposed solutions to this. Um, again, as Kurt indicated, as soon as a actual solution gets proposed and people like Matt get to look at it, it all of its flaws fall out. Um, that, and that just continues to be a problem. That said, there are technologists, um, several who I can name, um, who continue to say this is possible and we should be doing it. Um, they're just, I mean, Several that I can name, probably this many though. Like, it could compare to the wealth of people who say this is not possible. You can't do it. This adds complexity. There are so many problems. So, right. and and no one's actually produced a complete system, right? I mean, yeah. you know, people have basically said, well, you know, if 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 you were to like give me a giant bucket of money, I'd be able to come up with something that, that would would work that would look sort of approximately like this. But nobody's ever actually built that. And actually, that's one of the ways in which that National Academies study uh, that came out last year is actually pretty helpful because it's it's kind of drawn a line that said, you know, before you can claim that you solved this, you have to be prepared to answer this list of questions that aren't very easy to answer, right? That you that you really have to uh, uh, understand a lot of of very difficult implications for, and nobody has ever even posed the list of, of complete answers uh, to that yet. 
Thank you. So I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'll defer in uh, so other attendees can ask. But um, I mean, how, how do these governments propose to like solve the open source problem that comes into play here? I mean, you, you can put a lot of pressure on Apple, Google, Microsoft, or whoever, but you can't you can't put the open source genie back in the bottle. I mean, what, so. I think uh, people may have different answers to this. One of, one of my answers is that uh, so long as those systems are not ubiquitous, they're not as worried about that. If they got every every iPhone backdoored, every Android phone backdoored, uh, you know, WhatsApp on any platform backdoored and so on, they've gotten billions of people backdoored. And if it's true that some people can use an open source solution so long as they compile it on their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, rooted uh, Android phone and yada, 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 that like, that's the situation that they ended up with after the first crypto wars. There were things like PGP, there were a few other things that, uh, but it were, weren't used by enough of the population. They really got re-concerned about this after, by default, without anybody doing anything about it, they were sending iMessages with like strong encryption. Uh, when WhatsApp flipped a switch, I mean, it's more complicated than that. It was a big switch. But nevertheless, turned on encryption for a billion users. Like, that's, that's what's made governments uh, uh, nervous. So I'm thinking that probably if they got the rest, they would uh, just be satisfied. But, well, not satisfied. They will right. never and be satisfied. So, uh, they'll never be satisfied. There, 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 I'm sorry, please. Uh, this, uh, this gets to one of the differences between Crypto War One in the 90s and what we're currently doing. In the first crypto wars, this was about end-to-end -end encryption software for communications um, of, you know, between two computer users. Uh, what we're fighting this battle about today is a little bit different. It's almost entirely about two things. Primarily device encryption that's relying on some sort of hardware in the device uh, where there's more to it than software. You're actually buying something with hardware support for encryption, such as a, a phone that uses um, trustable hardware to unlock itself when uh, someone gets uh, physical control over it. And the other is services that are enabling end-to-end -end encrypted communication, like iMessage and, and, and WhatsApp and so on. And there, you know, it, it's, even if the software is open source, you're still rely, relying on a centralized service that can have pressure put on it. So open source does not, you know, open source just doesn't like, um, like end signal, the question. Yeah. Like Signal or Telegram or those folks like make it a lot more complicated for them though. Yeah, or Telegram for example in, in Russia, uh, they've been sort of banned from Russia because they won't turn over the, the key. Right. Um, and I haven't looked at this uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks, but as far as I know that that's just the situation they're like, at, uh, uh, at, uh, un unable to agree, um, and yeah, you could have have some of those situations where you're just like they will ban the protocol. Uh, Kevin, did you have something to add? Well, yeah, I mean, just uh, part of their response to that point is simply a good enough solution is still a solution. You know, you say, well, but you're not going to stop the smartest criminals, and they'll be like, well, we're happy catching all those dumb criminals. Uh, but also, and it's a fair point. You know, part of what they're concerned about isn't necessarily the communications or phones of the bad guys themselves. It could be witnesses. It could be victims. It could be a dead body with a locked phone. And, and you know, they're not, you know, this average person who just got killed, they're not going to have, like, gone out and especially gotten a, you know, a, a, a bespoke version of Android that had good encryption. Um, and such that, like, you know, a, a good enough solution would help them with that scenario. I want to add a word of caution here because a lot of times I hear this specific talking point from people who are like, well, I can protect myself no right. matter what, yeah. um, and so this is okay. And really it's going to be about the people who don't know to use those tools or the people who um, can't afford the really fancy stuff. Um, and so just a caution, if you are technically savvy enough to always know to use open source or to use the more secure tools that come, at, don't come that don't come out of the countries where there are encryption laws, that's wonderful and I'm really happy to you. But also think about those who are maybe less technically savvy and less privileged 
Um, and this is a fight that we need to keep going on for, for them. Yeah. All right, we have a few more minutes for the end of our hour. Let's have the question here in the front. Thank you. Um, so what you've been talking about is more of the overt approaches to breaking cryptography and some things, things like that. Um, what about the more subvertive ways that governments can, we, like you know, getting SSL certificates, breaking CAs, um, picking particular encryption curves, or even just even hacking into um, providers themselves, like you know, Google's network would sniff for the longest time, and other networks as well. So, what does the panel think about the more subvertive techniques versus the overt policy and um, uh, operational techniques or operational security? Oh, I, actually, I could kind of answer this, but mostly I want to answer it because I want to end on a really positive point. Um, there was a question coming out of the Snowden documents about if the NSA had messed with encryption standards. We're not going to be able to break the encryption itself. We'll just mess with the things that encryption is built on top of, so it's weak enough that we can break into one of its foundations, and it won't matter that we can like we can attack it at its base. Um, the encryption standards in the U.S. are mostly produced by a government agency called NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technologies, a government agency nobody's heard of, even if they've heard of the NSA. Um, and when this all came out, NIST instituted a, a process to say, okay, how are we going to institute our encryption standards in the future? And they produced a draft document that said, we're going to make sure that we take law enforcement interest into account when um, doing these standards and we said oh no this is bad pull this back and then they instituted another draft and they were like okay we're going to make sure those interests are in the room but we're not going to let them override like we're still going to have them there but they won't override anything else and we kept saying no you can't have law enforcement um, interests making decisions on encryption standards we have to pull this back more they instituted a final draft um, I want to say two years ago that actually said law enforcement interests can have no say um, in the encryption standards that we produce. It was a really big victory. It wasn't preordained that that was going to happen. Um, some people on the stage had a lot to do with it. And so that is the policy at NIST as it stands now, is that when they produce encryption standards, law enforcement and security interests cannot be taken into account when they do that. That's just one of the things that you mentioned, but it was a really, it, we don't get huge victories in this space that often, and so it was a positive thing to, to note here. All right. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, let's uh, leave on a high note there. So let's give a warm round of applause to our panelists here. And thank you all.